you should tell everyone probably where you are tuning in from. I'm in my home in Montana. I'm quarantine, self quarantining in Montana. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and speaking of which, you know, uh, first off, curious, you know, a lot of us are turning to music and such uh, as a distraction right. in this time. Unfortunately, that's been taken away from you. So what are you doing during to uh, occupy your time during self-quarantining? Uh, good question. Reading a lot of books. Uh, you know, I can't hear well enough to hear music yet, unfortunately. So, um haven't uh, it's a good time to listen to music or read books and uh boy i've been reading a lot in fact i got three recommendations for music books one is the new nick Lowe book called cruel to be kind which is fantastic uh another one is i i just read the uh the kind of the definitive grateful dead book so many roads which is pretty mm -hmm. good and my favorite of all of them i'm not quite finished with it but i'm just loving it is uh Mike Bloom, called Guitar King, Mike Bloomfield's Life in the Blues by David Dan. Tremendous. About Paul Butterfield Blues Band and that whole era. Really, really great. Now, I'm curious, you know, uh, uh, as a professional musician, when you dig into these biographies and autobiographies, what, what makes for a good read for you? Well, I, the same thing that makes a good read for anybody. I, nothing to do with music. It's how the story's told. I mean, Elvis mm -hmm. Costello's got a great book, actually, I think. And, and and one of the best ones I've almost ever read is Rodney Crowell's book is great. Uh, those are all music books. I got a bunch of other books that I've been reading as well. So I can go books for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's been two and a half years since I've been able to listen to music, right? Yeah. So I've been I've been listening. To, I've been reading a lot, needless to okay. say. Okay. But uh, the the Bloomfield book in particular, what makes that so, you know, because you, you lauded that over all the others, it seems. What makes that so special? Well, for me, the uh, the B Paul Butterfield Blues Band was sort of my my inspiration, really. Uh, I had played, started playing harmonica before that, but I saw them in New York. I was at prep school in New Jersey, and I saw them in Town Hall in New York. And it just changed my life. I mean, they were so great. And um, I became a Butterfield fanatic. And, um, and of course, Michael Bloomfield was the guitar player. And the, and the book is not only about, about Bloomfield, but it's about the whole era. And it's, mm. uh, it's really a great book. Okay. Um, now, I also wanted to ask you about the new album, Weather. Uh, sure. First off, I was curious with the song, One of the Boys, which you guys wrote initially for Willie Nelson. First off, did you guys perform it pretty much the way you intended for Willie Nelson to perform it, or did were there adjustments you made to make it a little bit more Huey Lewis sound? No, it, it, well, you know, wrote for Willie Nelson. I mean, the, the real story is there's a really great record producer in Nashville called Dave Cobb who I had lunch with, and he... Um, he suggested that I try writing a song for Willie, which was flattering nonetheless. Uh, I mean, obviously, I love Willie Nelson, but I thought it was like, right, I'm going to write a song for Willie Nelson, you know. Uh, but uh, but I did. I woke up with this idea uh, almost complete. I shared it with Johnny, and we started to make a demo uh, with our guitar player, James Hera, and on, on his computer. And then we just kind of... Uh, we started just as a demo, and we, we cut it on the road and we, with Johnny's computer, and then we put Bill, we, we mic Billy's drums up on the on the stage at a sound check, and he played to it there, and uh, John Pierce played bass into the computer, and then we had it. Uh, we didn't have any pedal steel on it, but we had it just like that. I sent it to uh, him. Uh, he, he, he liked it a lot, but uh, uh, apparently didn't get the gig. And so um, that was that. And then uh, it was Bill Gibson who, you know, said, man, I, I told him, you know, apparently uh, Willie never heard the song and it's it's over. But Bill said, man, I think we should do it. Um, I think it's great for you. And uh, I re-listened to it and uh, realized that the lyric that I'd written for Willie Nelson was, in fact, uh, my life story, really. 
Hmm. And so the the version on the album is that the the demo version that you guys sent? Yeah, it, it's oh. the same version. I sent it to John McPhee, um, mm. our old guitar player from Clover, who's in the Doobie Brothers now, right? And uh, in the Hall of Fame Doobie Brothers now, actually. Yes. And uh, and he played pedal steel on it, you know, killed it. And then uh, that was that. Yeah, and I'm I'm curious about that because did you give john mcphee direction on all right this is what we're looking for or is it just a case of you send it to him and said you know add what you think is best yeah no i i actually did give him a little direction i said that um you know i i told him to just cut two tracks he didn't need any more than two tracks i told him one cut it like you were just like you think it should be and then mm. and another one just play fill every hole just do as much as possible on one and uh, and that's what he did. And then I said, and 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 I don't want. I didn't really even know what I what I how to articulate this, but I wanted a kind of an old pedal steel sound, kind of the old Hank Hank Williams sound. Not quite slide, not quite um, lap steel, mm -hmm. still pedal steel, but not the jazzy neck kind of thing, the old school stuff. And he. Um, McPhee knew just what I was talking about. He, in fact, he articulated the. He's got. He's quite a collector of pedal steels and all this, and he knew mm -hmm. just the instrument to use. And he told me that he located the pedal steel somewhere between Hank Hank Williams Sr. and Bakersfield, and it, <laughs> it, it, it came out perfect. He, I mean, you know, McPhee's an incredible player. Yeah. He can he can play anything, and he's a great guy, and he was he was just wonderful. Just did it. He did it in one day. Oh, really? You cranked it out that fast? Sent it back the next day, virtually, yeah. Well, that's that's disgusting in a way. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he's, he's extremely talented. He's mm -hmm. got skills. And then, you know, another thing I was curious about with the album was with the song Pretty Girls Everywhere, when... Right. When you're when you're recording a cover, what's a what's the goal with a song like that? Because I'm assuming it's not to just reproduce the way the original was done, note for note. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, that that's that song is kind of interesting because it was originally pitched uh, to me by um, Aaron Neville when we took the Neville Brothers on tour in the 80, uh, 89 maybe, mm -hmm. 89, 90, something like that. Our tour was sold out, and the my my booking agent, Danny Weiner, said, well, the tour's sold out. Who do you, who do you want to open? And I said, how about the Neville Brothers? <laughs> and and they, they accepted, and we had a wonderful tour, got, you know, had jammed every night on stage and got to be real close with them, still good friends. And at the end of the tour, Aaron told me, he said, um, have you ever heard a song by uh, Eugene Church called um, uh, Pretty Girls Everywhere? I said, never heard it. He says, man, you need to do that song. I said, what? He says, you need to do that song. It's right up your alley. And he sent me a seven-inch vinyl single of yeah. the song, which I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't have a record player. I was, uh, and so at the time, and I just kind of forgot about it. And I rediscovered it like three years later, uh, three years ago, and um, played it and realized he was quite right. And so, and that one, we, we you know, we pretty much did just copy the copy the original. Of course, mm -hmm. we had better rec recording techniques, so the, right. you know, the, the the fidelity is a little better than the original. But basically, it's just a it's just a cop of the uh, the original. Okay, and well, that brings up because you've said in, in a number of interviews now that the band is better now than it's ever been, which yeah. hey. A is, is, is saying something because it's not like you guys were slouches in the past. Uh, but B, oh, yeah, oh, that might be it. That might be part right. of it, actually. It <laughs> might not have been that good to begin with. <laughs> but, well, first off, I'm curious, how is the band better? I mean, you know, in what ways? Uh, good question. Choices. You know, note choices. Um, how, how, to, how, how to hit notes, how to save yourself in terms of a two hour performance, so you don't give it all away and early and so on, how to pace yourself. And, and just the, uh, not only note, note, note choices, but rhythm choices, how not to be always kind of on the beat, but sometimes be 
around it and sometimes float with it and so on. It's just experience and just being settled. And, um, you know, I mean, I just think we, we were improving all the time. Hmm. We, up until up until you know my hearing collapsed, we were uh, we were as good as we've ever been. And do you think that that can only be you know acquired through time and just performance after performance after performance? I do, I yeah. do, I do. I, I mean, I think that's you, you know you just have to. I mean, experience is everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, uh, with your own singing, you know, I found it interesting because, and this happens with all singers, that you can't, it's it's harder to reach the higher notes that you did when you were younger, <laughs> but, you know, your your voice, you know, has, has gotten this uh, even deeper and richer. And so right. was that kind of a okay trade-off in the sense that, all right, now I've got all this other area to explore? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Uh, you know, and then when you write in in appropriate keys, right? Uh, uh, Weather's written in my sort of adult keys, if you will. The yeah. earlier stuff is a little higher, and so. Um, but yeah, that that's it. Yeah, um, I, you can't. As you get older, you you don't have the range you once had, but I think you have more experience. And uh, you know, it's a bit like a, a in sports, a, a pitcher. You might not you might not throw as hard as you used to, but you can locate the pitches better, and you know, you know, you can vary them up. You know when to keep hitters kind of, you know, off balance. Yeah. Or or, or to keep the audience on balance, as it were. Right. Right. <laughs> and then uh, speaking of the band, you've you've uh, over the years occasionally uh, brought in new band members. I'm curious. What were you looking for in musicians? What made for a good member of the news? Well, it, obviously they have to be good musicians, uh, but you, it's a good question because the hardest part about being in a touring band is the other 22 hours, right? I mean, you're gonna you're you're playing a bunch of songs, but you know you're gonna play them every night. There's only there's only so many songs you play, and mm. You want somebody who's going to be fully committed and improve every night and, and, and fit in the, the band as a, as a good band member and travel well and not complain and be a good, be a good road soldier. And um, so that's very, very important. I mean, uh, and, I, and I think it's a big mistake in bands. You know, you don't necessarily want the guy who auditions the best. It's, it's hmm. the guy who's going, who's going to eventually be the best. And let's face it, you know, rock and roll is not brain surgery. You know, most people can learn the music and you want somebody who really cares about it and is going to improve all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's and we've been very like, about... oh, sorry, I was go just going to say one of the nice things about, you know, it's, it's always, it's, a, it's always tough replacing somebody, but what's nice about it is that people, a new member brings a, a new sensibility to the songs and and that's that's always been the thing I've cared about most is that our our catalog uh, uh, that our catalog stays current, uh, stays you know important with time. That that it works. That our that our songs live for a long time. And mm -hmm. what's what's interesting is when you have a new member of the band, it gives the song a completely different setting somehow and i really enjoy that they sound differently in different hands you know and that's uh that's something that's uh real fun okay it kind of it makes it more of a living breathing entity rather than that's uh, it that's it yeah. okay. and, 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 and and it's it's fun to see the song that you wrote now take on these other these different kind of uh, uh different kind of versions you know fun. yeah and then well i I find it interesting that that line because I've never heard that before. You don't necessarily want the guy or girl who auditions the best, right? Well, I mean, like there are session musicians who can come in and play. They can get ninety percent of it on the first take, but but that might be all they're going to get because they don't it, they don't care enough. Maybe I mean maybe it's they're they're bored with it after a while. Do you know what I mean? And you uh, want somebody who might might only audition at seventy percent, but he's going to get to a hundred percent. It's 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 a tough thing to judge, but but uh, but that's what you're looking for, I think. Okay, uh, I'm trying to also 
take a peek at comments as they come in. They're coming by pretty quickly, though. One person did really? ask if 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 you have uh, if there's a favorite venue that you guys have played at over the years. Uh, wow. Let's see. Favorite venue. Well, there's a you know I remember the venues is for the gigs really. Yeah. I mean, in, and and a lot of our favorite venues in that respect are in Europe because the other 22 hours are so much fun. I mean, we played uh, <laughs> we played uh, the Zenith in Paris, and Bruce mm. Springsteen and Bob Geldof came and jammed, and that was a a big night. So that it's not a really a great venue, but it was it was great that night, you know. So mm. I, I think I kind of like the outdoor sheds. I mean, they're always uh, it's always a, a, it's good for the audience. And it's, you know, usually in the summertime and the weather's good and it, it's just a fun night that way. And, but the, the truth is the sound is everything. And some venues mm. sound great and some venues just don't. I mean, uh, uh, the Beacon Theater in New York just doesn't sound very good, I don't think. I mean, mm. uh, but it looks fantastic. Uh, yeah. there, but smaller venues sound good. And, uh, you know, sound is everything. So generally, the smaller venues are more fun. Mm -hmm. And then it's you know. interesting you talk about being, you know, outdoor venues sometimes are better just because, again, the things can, can breathe and expand a bit more. And it also reminds me of when you talked about why you uh, have always had horn players in the band when so many people just put that on tracks or, or, or something like that. And I remember your argument was because they push air and it's a whole different vibe live is it and it is i mean they, they push air you can feel a horn section that way and you can't feel a tape or a, or a chip that way and there's nothing like that i mean it's uh it's it's becoming a bit of a of a, of a rarity really you know i mean because you don't need to pay a guy to travel around the world and play one note at a time anymore you can put it on a chip or on a tape or you know on a uh, naughty bit and um but but there's nothing like the real thing hmm. and then i mean i always thought about it from the perspective of the audience member but now that you mention it how does a good horn section affect a singer well yeah i'm just like a good rhythm section effect. i mean everything you know everything makes but uh horns are fun because you know you get uh it's just a, you you got to like that kind of music to be honest. And, but I've always been a R and B fan, and there's always been a lot of horns in R and B, and I I just love the sound, you know. Mm -hmm. I love the sound. I mean, I grew up listening to that stuff, and so the, when we first our first horn section we worked with was Tower Power, and it doesn't get much better than that. And uh, yeah. that was always a thrill. And then we put our current horn section together, sort of in that image. Although we we only have one trumpet and that that makes better sense for us and another sax so uh, that that suits our music a little better but yeah I love the horn section and for a singer it's just something to bounce off of you know it's really they're always in in other places and it's a uh, it's just it, it's inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also remember Bill saying he felt a whole different energy. He said as a drummer there's nothing like kicking a horn section live. Right, right, and 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 we and the, the the fun part is when you have a your own horn section traveling, you're not just recording. You get to know those parts real good, and so for the drummer, the rhythm section and the horn section can really, you know, unite and really sound. Really, the drummer knows what the horns are going to do. Horns know what the drummer's going to do, and the whole thing comes together really wonderfully. Um, one lady, I'm sorry, I did not get your name, but one lady did ask, she wanted to know about your guys's, she said she loves your cover of the boys are back in town. Um, right. um, did you, did you guys put that into the set back when you were, you know, working with Thin Lizzy? No, no, okay. I, 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 I can't remember exactly when early though. And we, we would play it just occasionally now and then. I mean, I think we worked it up for a laugh at one point and, and really dug it. So we, uh, we, we, we did it. We, we didn't play it very much, but every now and then. And then we, I remember notably we played it with Gary Moore when he was, uh, we found ourselves in the same town with him and 
he came and sat in on that tune. That was pretty cool. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, we, I love that song. I love Philip Linnett. You know, he was he was my mentor in a lot of ways, and um, and that's just a great great song. Yeah, yeah. Um, now let's see another question uh, uh, that I had. Um, let's see. Oh, well, I was curious, I mean, you know, of the songs on this album, was there one that was particularly challenging, you know, more than the others? Yeah, sure. I mean, they're all challenging in their own way, but I'm going to say Hurry Back Baby was challenging because it's a, it's an old school shuffle mm. and we kind of wanted to, to bring it into the fold. You know, our, our this record is, a, is kind of as, as contemporary as we get, you know, it's kind of a... T- we, Kind of a contemporary record for us, and yeah. um, we wanted to bring that into the fold. So that that took a, a, a little bit of extra time, actually, and and thought. And I'm curious about that one in particular too. Like when you're writing a song like that, what comes first, the lyric or the groove? Well, that one was the lyric. I think uh, I was inspired by a. Um, I went into a convenience store in Georgia, and um, the, the, there was a kind of a cute little gal behind the behind the counter and when I after I paid for my whatever it was that I bought a bottle of water or something she said well hurry back now and I thought (laughs) it was it was charming the way she said it and Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was kind of the inspiration wow and then of course I had the lyric and and Bill Billy uh, wrote the tune frankly and uh, that was it Okay, and so do you, what happened? You just like then, send him. Hey, he's like, hey, I've you, I've got this lyric. What can you do with it? Is that it, how? Yeah. It works? I, I, okay. Well, I think well, we probably did it on the bus. Maybe you know, I say, Billy, how about this? And so Billy wrote the song, uh, wrote the music, and then we, then of course we worked it up, and then everybody pitches in. I mean, Johnny mm-hmm. is a kind of our resident arranger, and and uh, had a lot of good suggestions, and then. We put the horns on it, and Johnny wrote the chart there, and you know, so then we all kind of contributed at that point. John mm-hmm. Pierce, everybody. How much? Uh, that, that's kind of that's kind of our formula, you know. One or one or two of us will start something, and then we kind of get it going, and then uh, then everybody pitches in. Hmm. How much? How much work? How much material was worked out on buses? Well, it used to be a lot. Uh, mm. Not so much uh, later on because, you know, you get you get tired. It's not so it's not so. Uh, what's the word? It's not so uh, so exciting anymore. You know, it used to be very exciting to have your own bus and mm. be on the road with. Wow, we got our own bus. And after a while, it's it's uh, just another bus. You know, but mm. uh, uh, but but yeah, stuff gets done. I mean, that's when that's when band that's where bands are made. Is uh, is off the stage, you know, and and it's also where great teams are made. You know, I I always equate this with the 49ers. You know, the 49ers were a great football team, and and one of the reasons they were great was they were a very close-knit group, and Bill Walsh used to promote that a lot. And so after practice or whatever, they would hang out together, you know, Joe and Dwight and and Ronnie Lott and all these people, and, and, you know, you can almost envision – uh, Joe say uh, late late in the evening, uh, you know, maybe they're having a beer, and Joe says, "Hey, Dw- or Dwight says, what if I do this on that play and that?" And boom, and they, you think up things that you try, uh, you know, on stage, and um, I mean that that's where bands are really solidified. That's where that's where you, the personality comes through is off the stage, not yeah. even in rehearsal, just just hanging out. When we when we first started our band. That's exactly what we did. We would we'd rehearse a little bit, and then at night we'd do a cruise, and we'd all get in a, a station wagon, and we'd go to the, all the bars that had live music, and we'd okay. go from one to the other to the other, and and look at all the other bands, and we'd think of things and and cook up songs, and that 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 was really what how we started our group. Huh. And yeah, I guess no one's ever really talked about that. At least very few people have the idea that how you are off stage is going to have a humongous influence in how you are on stage. And it sounds like that's part of the secret sauce. Exactly. That is the secret sauce to making great bands, I think. 
is the time, you know, the, your, on your leisure time. Do you want to hang out? And in the beginning, we just hung out together all the time. And that's, hmm. that's when we wrote our best stuff. And then Lord knows there's been lots of stories of bands that have had trouble hanging out together uh, off stage. That, that's, you know. that's I'm the, curious. That's, that, that's what breaks bands up is the, uh, the other 22 hours. It's never really the state. Well, I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of reasons bands break up. But one of the big ones is what, what occurs off the stage. No question. Mm-hmm. You don't travel. You got to travel well together. It's, you know, you're going to be in this group and, you know, it's like this little magic circle that you're just going to be in for the whole time. So you, you got to, you have to get along. It's important. Yeah. And is there, I mean, you know, that was always one thing that people bring up again and again is that, you know, you guys never made any of those kind of headlines and, did you just pick people well, or is that something yeah. you Damn it, done? should have made some headlines. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, headlines are good, right? Yeah, yeah. depends on the no, headline. I, I, I'll tell you, I think the answer to that is that we were lucky in that way, in that everybody's roles suited them. You know, um, it, it just, you, you know, the thing that breaks bands up also is, one person's jealous or one person wants to do something on their own or, or some, or there's a, you know, a side man who wants to be a lead guy or that kind of stuff. And, and our, our thing works. I mean, we've had our differences. Don't get me wrong. We've had arguments and stuff, but generally we get along really great. And, and I think that's, that's really been the key for our band. Someone just uh, posted a comment asking, do do the band members all have different music influences? Well, um, you know, to a point, but but I would say we have remarkably similar influences, our band. I mean, amazingly. And in fact, that's really what blended us all together. You know, we're all from San Francisco Bay Area originally, where the psychedelic rage in the 60s and happened. And we were in, in some ways... A little young for that, maybe, and so, um, and for some reason, we all gravitated to rhythm and blues music. We listened to KDIA in Oakland was our favorite. I think it was because we were trying to rebel against the, the sort of psychedelic thing. You know, we we mm-hmm. were not as a kid. I personally, and I think this is probably true of the other guys. I'm speaking for them, but we weren't so enamored with the psychedelic scene. We liked mm-hmm. more the rhythm and blues stuff. And, and I remember at Fillmore Auditorium, man, when Paul, Paul Butterfield Blues Band played Fillmore, oh my gosh, it was like a light went off in my head. I said, <laughs> man, that's what I want to do, you know? Mm, and um, yeah. so and I, then, I think we have remarkably similar tastes, to be honest. Okay. And then, you know, also talking about, you know, having the right atmosphere and getting the right sound, there's, you know, so much has happened technologically with recording. Uh, uh, right. in the last couple of decades. And yet, when you guys did the Soulsville album, you guys went to Stax Records in Memphis. Um, and was it just to, to soak in the aura? Do you think there's, you know, a special sound in that studio? Oh, no. Uh, the, the studio, damn. Why can't I remember the name of the studio? <laughs> just because I'm, I'm an old oh. man. Arden. But we did it at Arden Studios, which was a secondary studio to Stax. Okay. And Arden Studios was cut. It's in Memphis, and it was cut with, uh, in fact, the original um, uh, stable, uh, stable, uh, stable Singers tune, uh, which we cut on the record. Help me. Come on, Chris. I'm losing uh, my mind. Um, but, um, uh, gosh, I can't believe this. <laughs> Uh, um, respect yeah. yourself. Yeah, respect yourself. Yeah. Was originally cut at Ardent. Respect the original. Respect yourself was cut at Ardent Studios, and that's okay. where we cut this record. But we had the advantage of having had um, had heard all these songs with the horns on them, and uh, by, and by that I mean we heard the whole record. So we right. rehearsed the record at, with the horn section, and we had. We were completely rehearsed that way, so we cut it all at once. We used two studios. 
We had the horn section in one studio and the rest of us in another one. I was in a vocal booth and we just captured it all live. That was our, that was our experiment and it was really fun to do. And, and we had an advantage over the, the originals of those recordings because in the original, originally what they would do is write the song, the band would play, the, would, would now record the song, and then they'd bring the horns in and put the horns, overdub the horns on top of it. So the drummer, when he played this track, never knew what the horns were going to do. But mm. we did because we had it already done, so we could actually incorporate the rhythm section into the, with the horn section much better than, than even the originals. And that, that's probably the most fun record we've ever done. You know, we've done records, all, we've made records all kinds of ways. We've, you can cut and paste and do them one, one instrument at a time, or you can just perform them and capture them all live. And that one was really captured live. I think there's three tracks on there. We overdubbed the, the, uh, the gals, the girl singers. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, there's several tracks there that are complete performances with no overdubs whatsoever. Hmm. Cool. I'm also wondering when you, you know, because you guys really steeped yourself in that music. I mean, you were already in it to begin with, but, you know, to make an entire album of that, you're really immersing yourself in all of that. After that, did it influence how you played your own original tunes? Did it change how you played things or approach things? Uh, yeah, I, 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 not really. Not, not really. I mean, we had done, we had already kind of, we did a record called Four Chords and several years ago, which was also a kind of a of an old school uh, retro record, and we and we we pretty much captured that record as well, and and we loved that process, and that is rather than you know doing things one at a time, capturing it all together, and so we wrote the 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 record Plan B, based on that new band because we, you know when we cut. Um, when we cut uh, four chords and several years ago, Johnny played all the all the saxes, and we, uh. we just hired Marvin to play trumpet, and mm -hmm. and uh, so all, all the horns on there is just Johnny and Marvin, and um, so we we formed the rhythm section and got Rob and Ron Stallings, who's fortunately is no no longer with us, uh, to um, to replicate that record, and then we mm -hmm. fell in love with that band, and so that's why we wrote Plan B for for that band. Uh, yeah. uh, and that's basically an original, all, all original songs, but captured in the same way that we had done f four chords. And then Soulsville was just an extension of that. The, mm -hmm. This one obviously is different. Now, yeah, and, and it's also fascinating that you you kind of change your your approach to songwriting based on who's in the band at the time. Yeah, I suppose. I thought. I mean, I I think. We, we we change our 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 production style based mm. on whose band and is it, based on who's in the band at the time. I I don't think the songwriting changes. I mean, the, uh, the songs are just kind of gifts, you know. Yet you, you have to have an idea. Songs need to be about something, and that mm. and how do you do that? You go get sit in a room and wait, you know. Uh, I mean, you just you just get an idea and then it starts. And and those ideas come from the muse. They come from somewhere. I wish I knew where I'd go there all the time, you know. But <laughs> once, once you once you have the song, how it's handled, how it wants to be recorded and produced, um, is 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 an interesting thing because because it's very easy to hear a great song in your head and then lose it while you're trying to record it. So the key mm -hmm. is to try to stay true to that song, let the song kind of dictate how it wants to be produced and how it wants to how it wants to sound. Hmm. And yet that's not too crazy. I mean, no, no, that, that makes total sense. What, what's also interesting is how patient you guys are in the sense that you had her love is killing me, you know, around for quite a long time, but you never felt like it was quite ready to release until now. True. We, uh, yeah, uh, well, well, Chris and I wrote that song a long time ago and we, um, we just never could get it right for some reason. It just never really worked. We tried it, and then we tried it live, and then we even tried it once with a drum machine, sort of halfway through, and then busted in with the whole band, uh, and that didn't work either, and so we just kind of dropped it. 
And then, like, several years ago, I can't remember, I think we just started jamming on it, and uh, it's it just felt right. And uh, uh, Johnny did a, a nice horn chart on it, and, and, and it came out great. And, and it's interesting, I think, because, you know, the song is, is, a, is a simple song. And sometimes the simplest songs are the hardest ones to get right because they have everything to do with feel and tempo and, 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 and just the little things, you know, because there's not a lot of chords to help you. So, mm. and that one, for some reason, it just went down great and, and uh, it just came out fabulous. Mm. And did you always have that kind of patience to say, this one's not ready yet? Let's let this percolate for a while. I, I don't. I. It wasn't like that. I mean, we we were we discarded the tune. We didn't. You know, oh, it, it wow. didn't work, and so we just threw it away. We were never going. We just revisited it as a, I, as a happenstance. You know, it just sort of happened. But yeah. uh, I don't. The patience, the patience on this record has to do with uh, really must be said Johnny Cola who spent tons of time you know tweaking each track we this this record was captured was was made a lot similarly to our sports record in that mm. we actually we actually paid real close attention to every track and and got every you know and really were very careful and very technical about it and uh, yeah. with pro tools and so on and and and, and Johnny did it, did it, did that and it, it took a, you know he he spent a lot of time on this record and doing all mm. that, and fortunately, the rest of us didn't have to do much. <laughs> <laughs> all and I then, do is sing. <laughs> that also brings up, it seems to me, a common misconception that you talked about. You said uh, one time you and Glenn Fry were at uh, a golfing event, and you were being asked about songwriting by, I think, Scott Osler, and... You talked about the misconception that you guys just have tons of songs that are just sitting right. in a back room somewhere, but right. that really it's no, we've we've released everything that we've you know had. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what and Glenn told him. He asked, he said, "You guys must have hundreds of songs everywhere." And Fry said, "You crazy?" He said, "I've he says we've used everything I've ever written." He said, "Really?" He says, "Yeah." He says. You show me a guy that's written a hundred songs. I'll show you a guy that's written ninety-six pieces of shit. <laughs> he says. If, he says if you write four songs in your life that make a difference, you're doing great. And and I, I think that's about right. I think that's about right. Uh, good songs, you can't conjure them up. They have to. They have to come to you. You have to just, you know, just be a be a vessel through which that these good ideas flow and. Just be receptive. I mean, you, you have to be receptive. You have to be you have your ears on. You have to be listening. But mm -hmm. there's no way to just say, I'm going to go write a song right now and have it be a great song. You just, you're, it's it's all luck. Yeah, well, I mean, because you've often talked about, uh, um, I think it was I Want a New Drug. You said you came up with the, that idea on, on the way to your lawyer's house. Yeah. You were uh, driving in a meet. Oh, oh, publishers. Yeah. Yeah, and immediately asked for a pen and paper the second you showed up. So that's right. It's not always. And then, and then, Go ahead. Yeah, and then we took a bunch of swipes at it. We had several sort of false starts with that song, and then Chris came up with a riff, and bingo, we, it was we were golden. Um, someone had a comment. They want to know uh, what it was like to tour with Stevie Ray Vaughan back in the day. Yeah, it was cool. I mean. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of a there's a there's kind of a, another funny story that was when um, you know I, I knew about the fabulous Thunderbirds because I'm a harmonica player and I know about Kim Wilson and uh, you know harmonica players is a very small group we all pretty much know each other and uh, and I knew about Kim and what a great harp player he was in the fabulous Thunderbirds and then we heard that he had a younger brother. Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, and Jimmy and Jimmy Vaughan was obviously the, the guitar player who's yeah. a fantastic guitar player and probably the best Jimmy Reed style guitar player living. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and but when we heard he had a younger brother who was amazing. And when his record came out, Texas Flood, I, I was knocked out by it. I remember I remember stopping a session uh, of the Jefferson Starship 
next door at the record plant and saying, hey, wait a minute, guys, you got to listen to this. And I put the record on <laughs> and, and right in the middle of their session. And they listened to it. And I remember like two or three of them went, man, that's incredible. And the other five guys went, what? I don't know. I don't get that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but when, 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 our, when uh, and this was probably 84, maybe, I guess. And our tour was sold out. And, and once again, the agent said, uh, hey, your tour is sold out. Who do you want to open? I said, Stevie Ray Vaughan. He said, who's that? I said, check the record out. And I sent him the record. He said, well, it's great. Let me, let me check into it. And then um, Stevie Ray had a, had a manager at the time who, and they asked for like more money than they were worth. And my agent says, this is ridiculous. We can't pay him this kind of money. They're not worth anything, and it'd be, it, we're just helping them by putting them on the tour. They should be paying us. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I said, forget about it. Pay them. Just pay them. Mm. Trust me. You'll be, you'll be glad you did. And um, so the first show, and I'll never forget, it was, a, it was a, in Oklahoma City. And um, I can't remember the name of the venue. Too bad Bill Gibson's not doing this. Cause Bill's the memory for our band. Oh. Bill remembers well, all this stuff. We'll get uh, Bill but, on. Uh, we'll do this with Bill. Well, <laughs> Let's do Save up your Bill questions. He, it gets really, yeah. Billy can answer the when and where's, believe me. Okay. But um, we, um, I remember the very first show was at Oklahoma. It was in Oklahoma, and it was at, at the the venue there. I can almost remember the name, but the outdoor venue, big venue, probably ten thousand people, something like that. And um, Stevie Ray, normally we would show up kind of before we play, but after the opening act is already played. But this was the first show, and I wanted to see it, so I said, I got to get there early. And, and I remember showing up early, and uh, and I just went straight to the wings of the stage, and they, the you know, it was Steve Ravon Double Trouble with Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton, and they were just killing it. And I was going, wow, that's great. And the song ended, and there was, first of all, a moment of dead silence, and then, we came to the audience and I had this terrible sinking feeling uh -huh. I went oh my gosh that's horrible these people don't get this they don't get I can't believe that and so then the band finished their set the the double trouble did and they went yeah. boom they they clearly had a bad night they were uh, you know put off by the reaction went into their bus so I went over and knocked on the door of the bus and the road manager said, what? Oh, oh, hi, man, hi. And I said, yeah, I just wanted to say hello to the boy. But he said, uh, oh, well, just a minute. Let me check. And because they were obviously not having a good time. He said, all right, mm -hmm. come on in. So I, I went in. I saw the, the three guys were in the back lounge commiserating. And I told them, I said, look, fellas, you're tremendous. And these people are idiots. I said, but here's the thing. <laughs> They're invested in us. They, they, they know our music. They played the record on the way to the venue. No matter how good you are, they, they're bound to think that we're going to be much, much better. So there's no way you're going to score here. What, what's going to happen is when they go home tonight, they're going to say, hey, you know what? That first band was pretty good. I said, so just relax, have a great time, and believe me, this will be good for you guys. And, and they did. And we had a wonderful tour, and we jammed every night. Stevie Ray got on played bad is bad with us on every single night and we just were we were we were inseparable for the whole tour it was really fun yeah that's that's great that's that's a very cool story and as you've told and, recently and, 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 and you know it's it's a lesson too it's a lesson for performers that a lot of people don't completely always get a lot of performers and that is that if you have an audience that's standoffish the worst thing you can do is press harder and go after them the, what mm. you need to do when they're standoffish is you be standoffish as well. Make them come to you. And even if they don't, just that's all. Play your songs and get out of there. Uh, but And when they start to warm up, now you can start to warm up. But, to, but as soon as you try to press on an audience that's not immediately receptive, that puts them off even further. Mm. Yeah. And as you've said in recent interviews, I, I find the whole this story interesting because you talked about you guys lived through that experience when you opened for the Doobie Brothers, um, <laughs> and so it's kind of yeah we did. It comes around, you know. Yeah, I mean we 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 got boot 
we got we were we were happy if we could get all of our songs that i remember we 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 opened for the doobies and our first show we i think we had like 10 or 11 songs and we played 10 11 songs and and you know as soon as the song would end boom, and there'd be quiet Ooh, booze would start <laughs> so we learned we learned to launch right into the next song immediately so mm -hmm. not so you couldn't don't give the crowd a chance to boo and um you know it, and i remember after our first show we got through all 10 times and we were despondent it would have been it was a tough reaction and i said man that's terrible and they said are you kidding that's you did a lot better than the fabulous thunderbirds they didn't even get through their whole set <laughs> So we thought, okay, well, that's a, at least we got all 10 songs in. <laughs> but we did, we must have done 30 dates with them, and that was the case every single night. Wow. So, well, it says something about your guys' persistence, which obviously paid off. Well, yeah, persistence, it's a big, it's a big deal in this business, you know. I'm mm -hmm. always asked, I'm always asked by people, like young musicians and stuff, and they say, you know, what's your advice for me, and I usually say, go back to college and study Mandarin, you know, <laughs> uh, or, or, or they say, what? and I always tell them, I say, look, unless it's the only thing you want to do, then forget it. But if it is the only thing you want to do, then just swallow your pride, listen to everybody, and just keep pushing. And, you know, that's what we did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact is, I know I feel this way, and I and I'll bet you everybody in my band feels this way. I, even though you know we've been very successful, knock on wood, and I have all the trappings of success, which is wonderful. I if I would be happy if we had to be playing harmonica down the street in a in a blues band uh, with nothing right now, because that's really what I love to do. And mm -hmm. I mean, if you really love to do something, it's not about that's what success is. And as long as you're struggling, you're not going to you're not going to quit. You know, why would you quit? It's what you're doing, what you love to do. And, and, and it's easier to stay together without success. Success breaks bands up more than no success. When you're struggling, you're a band of brothers. And you're working, you know, you're working together and trying to get better and trying to get over and trying to get your songs across. And, you know, that's that's the, the moment you feel most alive. That's the best moment of all. Those are my favorite memories. So the artistic memories when we're struggling to, you know, we're right in the heart of rock and roll. We want we want people to hear this song. Mm -hmm. Fun. Yeah. Yeah, to put it another way, because I recently did an interview with uh, 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 Chris Fryer of the Zach Brown Band, and, and he said, you have to define what success is to you. And to me, he said, success always meant that on my tax form, under occupation, I could get to put musician. And he said, in that That's sense, it. I've been successful since I was 17 years old. No question about it. Success is doing what you love to do and feeling good about your work, you know, feeling good about your art. I mean, mm -hmm. we're artists, and we just that that you have to you have to love what you do, and uh, and if you do, then you're successful from the get. All right. Well, I've kept you on here for a long, long time, <laughs> way more than I thought we would be. Really? Are you really? How yeah. long? It seems like it's five minutes. It's, no, it's it really been does. almost an hour. We're <laughs> really? Yeah, wow. kind of. At least fifty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I'm Chris, just... you get, by the way, I, I'm happy to tell, and I hope everybody's listening because you now, and I think you know what's coming. You, you, <laughs> you, 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 you've been awarded Hulex Employee of the Month. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and that, that's a big deal. That's going to go right on the wall next to our office manager, Nina Bombardier. Yeah. Because Nina Bombardier has been Hulex Employee of the Month for 27 consecutive months. <laughs> <laughs> so you just knocked her off the, chair, off the top podium. Right. Congratulations. Okay. Well, yeah, it's, it's been eight and a half years, but I'm finally starting to show some promise. You, you are. You are. All right. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. Well, thank you for making the time to do this, and uh, maybe we'll do it again down the road. Good. And I, I'd love to. It didn't hurt a bit. Uh you know, I'll do anything to promote our new record. We, we're we're very proud of our record. Um, we think it's it's among our best work, and um, 
I just like to get the tunes a nice head start. You know, I, unfortunately, I can't sing right now. I can't hear music well enough. You know, it's, it's very frustrating. But, but, uh, but I do want people to hear these songs. We're really proud of them. And so I'm happy to do what I can do. All right. Thank you, everyone, Thanks, for tuning in. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, folks.